Um, growing up, I had two amazing parents, and I have one older brother. Um, I grew up in a small Methodist church in Hernando, Mississippi, and I guess I can't remember a time that we really did, weren't involved in church unless we were sick, but I went through confirmation when I was nine, and I think that's what everyone had to do at, at the church. That was just, I guess, all the, all the young kids, that's what we did. Um, growing up, I was very involved in sports. I played competitive softball, competitive basketball. Um, I played through all, all my life and I, I excelled in those. And I think that's kind of what shaped my early childhood is I spent a lot of time doing it. I was gone on the road all the time. And when I was, I guess when I got to junior high, it kind of seemed like I kind of felt the pressures of family and coaches and to be the best and I always sought the attention of everyone around me the world per se. I wanted the status, I wanted to be the best, how many points could I score the next game or how many how many dives or you know anything that sought attention to me. I wanted to be the best, I wanted the status, I wanted the popularity and I feel like a lot of pressure was on me at that time from just coaches in general. So when I was in eighth grade, um, I was hanging out with my brother and his friends and um, they started drinking alcohol. And I thought that was the cool thing to do to stay with the crowd. And so I started drinking when I was in eighth grade and I really thought that that was, I really thought that that was the way to gain friends. Um, from junior high to high school, I kind of kept on the same path. I lied to my parents all the time. I went out. Um, almost every weekend, I, I remember times drinking before basketball games and nobody even knew it. Um, but on a high school, when I was 16, I went to a church camp. Um, and I really thought that, um, I really thought that I was saved that day, but I think, I did not, I did not pray the prayer, but I know I came back revived, not I wasn't saved, but I came back and I was changed for probably at least two weeks. And um, I was on fire, but then it just suddenly faded back to the same life that I was living. Um, on to my senior year, I continued to go out. I remember a time where we, a couple buddies before the football game, we all went to the liquor store and paid a homeless man to buy us alcohol. And that's just, where we where I was in life um the end of, end of my senior year I, I think I had multiple scholarship offers for multiple sports in four or five different states and I chose not to take it just because I wanted I wanted the status I wanted the most friends I wanted to go out to the most parties I wanted to have the most fun and I was the life of the party every, every party it seemed like I was just the center of it, I guess, and I was getting the attention that I wanted. I was getting it in people. I was getting it in relationships. I was getting it in, or what I thought was relationships, um, just things of the world, and I was filling my body with things that were of the world, and they definitely weren't of Christ, and I was definitely far from Christ. Um, throughout college, I continued to go to church. Um, even on Sunday, I probably came in hungover, I'm sure. But I was there and I, my prayer life was probably non-existent until something happened. 
and I know when I've had a few tragedies, small tragedies that happened throughout college and I know I prayed, but I only prayed when it was bad. I never prayed when it was good. And so that kind of was my college days and my grades definitely suffered. I know I went out probably Wednesday through Saturday, probably spent a lot of my parents' money that they worked hard for. And um, it was um, spring of 2013. I was in my last semester of undergrad at Ole Miss. Um, I know I had come home one weekend and my dad said that my mom was sick. And I mean, when you think sick, you think of like a cold. And he said, no, she can't really focus at work. Um, she can't remember how she gets home. Uh, so they had they had taken her to many doctors in um, around Memphis, Arkansas, Mississippi, and they just couldn't figure it out. At first, it was Lyme's disease, and but she continued to progressively get worse, and it was where literally she couldn't go to work. And so I, I know we ended up filing for just early retirement, and so fast forward to. Um, fall of 2013, I was starting um, grad school at Delta State, and I didn't hardly come home at all that semester. Um, it just, I was just still the life of the party and going out, and um, I did get plugged into a Bible study, and it did hold me grounded and always made me feel guilty after I went to Bible study, after I had gone out the night before. And so she had progressively gotten worse and it got to the point where she couldn't drive. And when I come, when I came home, she was literally bedridden. I mean, it was a non-existent relationship with your mom. And um, fast forward to um, spring of 2014, um, I, I didn't, I still didn't come home much, but I was coming home this weekend because it was spring break the next week and I wanted to have my last rally, my last hoorah with my friends and we were going to go to the beach and we were going to party and we were going to hang out with old boys and it was just one last, one last party before undergrad. March 8, 2014, um, I was leaving for that next day for um, spring break. I was going to the beach. And I got up like any other morning. Um, my mom had made me coffee. She had washed my clothes, getting them ready for the next day. Um, and I always, that morning I was saying, I'll, I'm going to the gym. I'll be back probably in an hour. Um, I always, I always go to the gym. It's just normal. It's not anything out of the ordinary. Um, but I, I told her whenever I was leaving, she said, I'm washing your clothes. I'm getting your bathing suits together for tomorrow. And I'll see you when you get back. And I said, all right. I said, bye. And I love you. And I walked out and it, this, this was probably at 10 o'clock. And I was gone maybe an hour and 15 minutes or so. And I came home and there, was, there wasn't there was anybody there. The car was gone. Um, there was a note on the counter and it said, I'm going to Dollar General in Como. And I was like, well, she couldn't have gone because she has, hasn't driven her car in eight months. She did not drive a car. And so immediately I start frantically calling my dad and I call him and I'm, I'm just saying, where, I don't know where she is, I'm in a panic. And so he's like, well, don't freak out, you know, ride to Como and see if she's there. And I rode to Como that she was nowhere to be found. So I came back to Senatobia and I checked the Dollar General in Senatobia and she was nowhere to be found. And um, so, my dad, I went and picked up a friend and we're driving around town seeing if we see her car. And so my dad calls and he says, well, I'll circle back to the house. 
And so he goes home and then that's when I get the call. Um, I got a call from my dad and um, he had found a separate separate letter beside his bed and um, I'll just read the letter. I have been cursed for a sin that God cannot forgive. Please go to church and spend lots of time at your farm and find peace. Please do that for me and your children. Um, immediately we um, go to the police station and we file a missing persons report. Um, it was, I bet we weren't there 10 minutes maybe and a call came over the scanner and they said that they had found an abandoned car, her car, on the West Helena Bridge and um, there, there was nobody in it, nobody around. That The traffic had literally stopped on the bridge. And um, the bridge is 119 feet and it goes into the Mississippi River. Um, immediately thereafter, I mean, th the search crews started. I mean, there was boats, there's helicopters. It was on every news station in Memphis, I think. Um, I think finally, for a long time, I just wanted all attention and now I finally got all the attention that I thought I wanted. And I remember just a, a whelm of emotions and I said God you, you just can't do this to me this is not this is not my life I have a perfect life I do what I want on my time and um, God said different that day and I remember just this wave of emotions it was mad sad empty lonely just just mad at the world and um, I wanted to change my circumstances and I couldn't and um, I remember two days after that had happened I had gone to my grandmother's um, and my grandmother was probably one of the most godliest people I've ever met in my entire life and I remember sitting there with her and I said I just there's no way I'm gonna get through this never and um, I remember her saying you just have to pray. That's all you can do. All you can do is pray, she said. And ever since that day, I every night before I go to sleep, I got on my knees and I said, I just prayed. I said, God, I cannot do this. I said, you know, just bring her back to me, please. And every night I would do it and she said, you know, you don't just pray when, when there's bad times. You pray in good times as well. And I, I will never forget that, and I still continue to do that to this day. Um, Fast forward a few months, uh, I'm still in a in a blur. I, I got, most days it's hard for me to get up, but I am, for my family, I'm the jokester. I'm the don't show emotions, and I think I carried probably a burden of the weight a lot of the time when everybody else was really emotional. But in it was May of 2014, uh, May 16th. I had at, got asked to go on a girls retreat um, church camp and I was like oh no I'm not, I'm not doing that no cell phone I'm not going to that um, but despite all that I decided I decided to go and I, I particularly remember one night it was a Friday night and they had an emotional speaker and she had a very very emotional testimony and I remember after that she was saying that she just let let everything go, like all the burdens, all the weight, and let God carry it for her. And I remember them distinctly saying, 
put all your burdens at the cross. Put them, put them to the feet of Jesus and let him carry the weight. And I just remember I had somebody praying with me and I prayed the prayer that, God, I just cannot do this anymore. I'm tired of carrying my burdens, my, my emptiness, my loneliness, um, the burdens of others on my back. I just can't do it anymore. And I prayed that God would save me that day and I would put everything I had into him and trust in him. And that's exactly what I did. And immediately I just, I felt a weight just off my chest. I couldn't, literally almost couldn't breathe. Like it was just so, so supernatural. And I just, I'm so thankful that I just decided to go to that, that weekend. A year and ten months after we had found the letter and it was January of 2016 and a duck hunter had was going to set up his blind it was 13 miles from the bridge and he noticed um, a small skull it literally just had dental it just literally just had teeth almost attached to it, it wasn't bigger than my hand probably and they called us the police did and they said we think we had believed that this could be your mom and i remember it was two days later and they had done a test of the dental workers and dna had proved that it was her and i just remember I'll, i was at work and i just remember just a flood of emotions they all came running back and but i remember just the closure that i felt that i prayed so long that god would bring her back and it wasn't in the way that I had wanted her to come back, but it was in a way that brought us all closure and brought us all together. And we relied on Christ for that. And I, and it was a blessing to us. And we had a funeral and we went through the mourning process again. We cried and we grieved, but we knew that she was with Jesus. And I know that she was with Jesus on March 8, 2014, it, just because that we had a skull that wasn't her. I mean, her body is in heaven with Jesus. Um, James 1, 2 says that, um, Consider it pure joy, brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And I think that over the year and 10 months or however long it took, like God was preparing me. And I know that it was not easy and it never is, but God does have a plan for your life and he had a plan for mine. He turned my trial into a triumph. He turned my, he broke me to bless me. And I know that people ask if I could take it back and have her back, but you can't be jealous of somebody who's already an attorney with Jesus. And I would have never been saved if, if I wouldn't have had her, had that happen. And God's timing is never, never when you want it to be but it's always perfect timing and it's his timing and you have to trust that god really has a plan for your life and you you probably won't see it today you may not see it tomorrow and you may never see it but um he does have a plan and if you trust that plan i know that um god will work in your life and i know that god is not done with me yet he's still preparing me and he's still using me and i'm not saying that i'm perfect but God continues to bless me and I know that this has happened for a reason and I pray that I continue to serve Him and use this to glorify Him in all things and I will continue to glorify Him. And I'm Jenna Harris and His grace is enough. <laughs>